Sam, like I told you yesterday, Sam and everybody was like, you got to get Tom. You got to get Tom on here. He's got to be someone who's, well, he's got to be in the first wave of guests. So here you are. And again, thank you for joining us. Oh, man, man I'm flattered and honored. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as we do here, as we always like to get into the conversation, um, what I first like to do is like anybody can read a bio. But what mm -hmm. I like to do is, is ask you to, you know, give us your own introduction and how this leads us into the conversation is give us a little bit of background of yourself and how you got into this theater and performing arts world. Sure, I am a disciple of the Black Arts Movement. My, my, my kind of mentors were Ed Bullen, Sonia Sanchez, James Baldwin, uh, all of whom I studied with. And from that, began to realize that in the, in the latter part of the 70s, after graduating from a place called Amherst College, that I wanted to be an institution builder. So I started a theater, an African American theater in Atlanta called Jumanji Productions, along with many other wonderful folks that was kind of committed to uh, creating and contributing to the canon of, of African American dramatic literature. Did that for 22 years and for the last 20 years as a writer, as a director, as an actor, uh, as a composer, uh, and for the uh, for producer. And for the last 20 years, I left the organization in 2000, 2000 2001. For the last you know, 19, 18, 19 years, I've been freelancing uh, and working directly with artists on, on the development, creation of, again, of new projects, new works. Uh, I'm currently in the midst of working with a consortium of artists in Atlanta in response to this quote unquote racial pandemic called uh, Black Arts Action Coalition Plan 2021, which is again trying to redefine the cultural landscape for African American artists, not only in the city, but also in the country. So that's kind of my last 30, 40 years in, 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 in and around the neighborhood. That's right. That's right. Sound well, like Mr. Rogers, didn't I? What a wonderful <laughs> thing. <laughs> Come on, boys and girls. Let's go over here and see Harriet Tubman. <laughs> Come on, boys and girls. Let's go here and see Lorraine Hansberry. You know what I mean? That's kind of like what we do, right? That's right. That's right. Well, look, like you said, you know, you had the perfect, you had the perfect, uh, perfect description of it. Like we're, you know, we're in this racial pandemic, man. This is a crazy time. Like I tell people, you know, I talked to my dad who's approaching his 90s and I'm like, dad, have you ever seen anything like this uh, in, you know, in, in tandem? And he's just like, nah, I've never seen nothing like this happen all at once. Um, give me your, give me a little bit of, give me your thoughts about what's, about what's going on right now. Give me a little bit of your, of your thoughts about what we're seeing and with, you know, the racial tension and, and things that we have going on along with the pandemic? Well, I think what we, what we see is, is kind of a, you know, the history is, is cyclical. I mean, did we not see this in Tulsa, Oklahoma? You know, that when there was in a certain sense a regeneration of African-American life and, 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 and commerce, uh, that at some point in time it would burn down? Did we not see this in, in the 1950s with Auburn Avenue in Atlanta uh, and, and the turn of the century? Did you not see this in 1919? We live in a colonial world. Right? We live in, 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 as a people, we are part of, of a plan that is about colonized people. And within that, then what you begin to have is, at some point, policies that are about your self-abnegation. You are dealing with policies that are not about you, you know, kind of uh, actualizing yourself as a full human being. And so as a race of people, of African-Americans, we struggle against that, that concept since 1619 when we first landed here. We struggle against this notion of what it is to be free, what it is to be fully enfranchised as a human being. What does human rights movement look like? What is our place within this culture and this society? Where are we within, as George Wolf says, the colored contradiction in a land that says all men are created equal? Oh, but that's only white men, right? If you're, if you're native, if you're indigenous, if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, if you're gay, if you're whatever it is that you are, you're excluded from that, from that promissory note, as Martin King said. So we begin to have these moments of eruption where people say, as uh, Al Sharpton said at, at you know, the funeral of George Floyd, I just need you to get your foot off my neck. I need you to get your knee off my neck, that the sense of suppression and repression of, of a people will always result in the sense of those folks trying to right the wrong, right the historical wrong, correct the sins. So what we see now, you know, in 2020 is, again, uh, a struggle of a people trying to restore democracy to a democratic order that is yet to fulfill its promise. And so we will always see, in a certain sense, what threatens that is the actualization of a people. Um, so you get George Floyd because he's working against the system of, of containment and order and repression. You will get, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the lives of bodies that were, you know, that at some point in time built this culture into what it is. Uh, and so now what we are in this pandemic is to say we're trying to right the historical wrong. 
And so people take to the streets. Their activism begins to speak to trying to correct the historical narrative, the sense of we, we have to, to reallocate resources so that it really does fulfill this, this prophecy and this, and this promise that all of us should be engaged and part of this American democratic experiment. Is the experiment going to work is where we're at, you know, in terms of this, this crossroads. Will this work going forward? And that is where I think we all have the opportunity and the challenge to make, you know, to, 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 to make true the vision of what this American democracy was supposed to be. That's where we are. We're at this crossroads. We're at this right. nexus. Um, will America, as Langston Hughes said, I too sing America. Will America be America again? Um, fulfill its, its, its promise to its people. To in fact, be what it said it, 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 it wanted to be. Uh, and to the extent that it doesn't, then we who, are, who struggle in this movement as artists, as activists, uh, say, we'll hold your feet to the fire to, to, to make sure that you cash in, that you honor the promise that you made to us. Uh, that's where we are. And uh, protest movements are always going to be, you know, the, the legs and stamina will always be young people in, in, you know, in the streets who are out moving and marching and changing, you know, the, the, the infrastructure and the architecture of racism. Um, it was young people, as we, as we buried John Lewis today, as we buried C.T. Vivian. It was young people in that movement. People forget that Martin King was in his mid-20s when he, when he led the Montgomery boycott. This was not someone we, we lose perspective. You know, when uh, John Lewis spoke at the March on Washington, when he was getting his knock in 1960, he was 20, 23. It was a young people's movement. SNCC was a young people's movement. SCLC was a young people's movement. What we now find that BLM and Black Lives Matter is, again, in the restorative tradition of social protest in this country, is a young people's movement leading the way, saying we need to correct the record. And now where do we stand in the midst of that discussion? Either you're going to be for or against. That's right. That's right. And so where does that, where does that bring us now in you know, in this world we're in with the, you know, the performing arts, especially where we're at this crossroads, we've had like, not just in performing arts, but in sports, in every industry, we've, you know, at where we're at now, we've had the declarations, we've had the mission statements, we've had the mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter statements, we've had the, you know, we're, we're, we're moving now into this place where everyone's made the statements, everyone's put out the banners, everyone's done this, where, what needs to happen now? Like, where do we, or no, let's let me let me let me let me back that up. Give me your experience as far as or your thoughts as this is as we have gotten to this point in mm -hmm. performing arts, as you know, a lot of people don't realize it is, but it is, as performing arts in the United States has been primarily like almost everything else, dominated by white culture, dominated by white leadership, dominated from a white perspective. Um only if you view the world that way. I don't view the world that way. Right. My paradigm shift is not has nothing to do with the sense of saying uh, how to see the world. And point. What the narrative is, what the deception is, is I want your point of view to always be through the lens in which, the, which again, comes from this kind of white cultural appropriation. That's not my worldview. Right. My worldview has never been that. I, again, part of rewriting the record was saying uh, and restoring the narrative is saying that the architecture of American culture is built on the minds and, and of, of, of people of color. So part of our job and responsibility as artists is to raise that consciousness, is to revitalize the so as, as traditional African drama, to revitalize, to, 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 as artists, we are about a cultural reawakening. And part of what that reawakening is, is to then revitalize the connections between social community uh, and, the, and, and, and the legacy of those who are, who are not living, those who are living, and those who are coming. That's what culture is. It embraces and begins to speak to the, to the larger narrative of, uh, of, of, of restoring humanity and consciousness in terms of, of human beings. That's what, Afri that's what, what, what culture is in African, in African tradition. And so where we are is this tug of war. You have this kind of Eurocentric model that says it's art for art's sake. It's right. a spectacle sport. You go, you sit, you watch, you listen to it. Chamber music is about the listening experience. Well, that's not the experience of African art. That's not the tradition of African culture and most culture, from native to, to, to African culture that then descends, as Paul Carter Harrison said, in the African continuum to uh, African American arts in the 20th century. Our culture is steeped in, whether it's the music, the dance, which is why you can't separate it out. It's steeped in the sense of a renewal of a community. It is art in service of other people. Those are the two worldviews. A Eurocentric view that says, the, that, that culture as a model is a spectator sport, or that art, in fact, should be in service of people. So that's where the tug of war is. So I never view it that we are so, somehow responding to 
these larger white paradigms that say we are, we have been marginalized. What I say is we are in a tug of war for, the, as, as 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 someone said, for the soul of America. What does art want to be? Does it want to be in service of other people? Does it want to be in restoring a kind of human narrative? Does it want to be in edifying a culture? Or does it want to be simply a spectator sport? And so that's the argument that we're having now. It's the same argument that they're having defund the police. Do you want a police force militarized? Or do you want a public, do you want to organize your resources around public service to a community that says, let's look at, me med let's look at medical facilities, medical institutions, educational institutions? Is that the way in which you want to organize a community? So our struggle right now is how is it that we want to organize this country around its, its, its creed? So what you said you wanted to be was this, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. You said all men were created equal, and by extension, all people are created equal. That's what you said. The contradiction is you don't rule that way. You create institutions that are built on, 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 on white supremacy. You make base institutions going back from the Klan, et cetera, to uphold and restore and, 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 and hold in check that idea of what white supremacy is. Right. And then you feed us this load of crap that says there's one bad apple, two bad apples. No, it's a system that is designed to contain. What we are saying is, if I look at the American ideal, the American democratic ideal as you defined it, I'm simply holding your feet as an artist to that narrative. So therefore, as an artist, what I am then saying is culture that must live in the middle of a community in service of that in upholding this cultural value that you said was more important. So I'm, I'm rejecting the white black argument. I'm holding white people accountable to what it is that you say. It's just like, it's basically like when they really, when they really started not liking King, when he was like, I'm coming, we're coming to get our check. That they never liked, the, the thing is, they, I mean, never, they liked never liked him. him. They never liked him. <laughs> <laughs> Never was, liked right. As, as Cornel West said, he was a revolutionary Christian in right. the same way that they never liked Christ, you know, right. and we saw what happened to Christ and we saw what happened to King. I mean, there was, there was never, it's only in revisionist history with the distance that we begin to romanticize him. What we also do is we put him out of check. We forget that he was a human being with, that was imperfect, that also was dedicated and committed to an ideal because if you put him out of check and make and, and make him somehow unreachable and unattainable, then it means the ideals that he stood for are unattainable to you as well. No, we have to reclaim history. We have to reclaim those folks and begin to put their narrative in the context of struggle, in the context of, again, making America, America again. That was, that's, that's kind of what I took from Katori Hall when she talked about when she did the that, mountaintop and she talked was. about the Jesification of Martin Luther King. And like, I always tell people like, my family's from the South. And when you go through the South, there was always three pictures hanging on everybody's, uh, everybody's wall. There was John F. Kennedy, there was Jesus, and there was Martin Luther King Jr. And it was- Or there was Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was, it depended on the calendar. But you're right, it was, it was an <laughs> so, and, and, so And to that extent, there were saints that walk among us because saints are, are, are are people who are imperfect men and women, you know, who begin to are defined by the greatness of their commitment. King, in a sense, is a, yes, there is a sainthood about him, as in John Lewis, as in C.T. Vivian, as in Bernard Lafayette, as in Jane Glover, as in all of those folks, as in Fannie Lou Hamer, as, you know, I mean, as in Malcolm X. I mean, those folks are, not that they are imperfect, that they are perfect men and women, but they stand for an ideal that all of us, in fact, can be committed to, which is restorative. You know, the idea of Everything is just trying to restore a, a human institution called American democracy. And we as artists, part of our responsibility, and it's always been our responsibility and job, is to hold, is to hold the society accountable to make connection to what it says it is, is important to itself. And right. to hold that connection, not only with those who have died, but those who are now living and those yet unborn. That's right. That is the cultural reawakening that we are engaged in. So social protest movements stem out of the sense of, again, trying to right the historical wrong. Right. And up to this point, especially in theater and performing arts, where or what, if there is anything in particular, where have we gone wrong in that tug of war? Where, where have we gone wrong in our part in that tug mm -hmm. of war? Like, you know, I, think, you know I mean, have, have we, has there been times where we've just not shown up unapologetically enough? I mean, where have we gone wrong on our side of this tug of war? I think we forget that it's a marathon, not a sprint. You know, that, and that we sometimes think that the work was done for us. 
mm. that in fact we find that we are the beneficiaries of those who came before us. I'm the ben which is why I said I am the sec I was part of the second generation of African American theaters that was the beneficiary of, of uh, John O'Neill and Gilbert Moses, the Free Southern Theater. I was the beneficiary of Douglas Turner Award and Negro Ensemble Company. I was the beneficiary of Woody King and and uh, and Ed Bullens at New Lafayette Theater and New Federal Theater. I was the beneficiary of black arts movement from Black House with, with, with Sonia and Baraka and James Baldwin and all of those who said, we, we root our art in the struggle and the upliftment of African-American people. And by uplifting and in fact recognizing our humanity, you recognize your own. That was their struggle. They moved us to a certain point. At some point you think, oh, struggle has been trying to do something else, as opposed to saying, no, we're advancing the argument. So I think what we have to say in the disconnect is, where did we stop advancing that argument? Where did we become complacent? Where did we look and say the job has already been done? Where did it become a me narrative as opposed to a we narrative? Where did it become about my Pulitzer Prize? My, you know, when did we get to the point that we allowed somebody else to define for us our God? I asked a student of mine you know, um, to have a discussion of Ed Bullens, and he couldn't. And I was like, OK, where did we fail in communicating to you the heroes and sheroes that began to create a cultural platform for us to stand on. And then you have to go further back than that. Then, you know, do you know who Gustavus Fassa is? Well, then we failed in terms of our educational system. Do we know who Jupiter Hammond is? Then we failed in terms of our educational system. Do we know who Phyllis Winnie? Do we know that we come from, a, from, a, from an African tradition, a pre-colonial colonial African tradition that is about art at the center of it, and that we simply are continuing continuation of that struggle. We are simply a continuation of trying to advance that narrative. If we don't, then what we have to do now is, rehaul, is overhaul the educational system so that cultural literacy operates at the center of how we teach our men, women, and children, black, white, native, et cetera. That then begins to accelerate and keep the sense of this marathon of, again, making America, America again. It, can, it, it creates a continuation. It's not about my play anymore. It's about how is my art the art that I am engaged in, not even mine, taking out that possession. You know, how is the art that I am engaged in in service to a larger ideal that's bigger than myself? Right. Because right. all of those who, in fact, got us to this point thought of the world and the art in contribution and in service to, again, you know, righting the wrong. It has to be bigger than you and me. It has to be bigger than ourselves. And it has to be in, cons in, you know, in consortium and in consult with all of those other communities. And there are then uh, where our strategic allies, who are our partners within predominantly white institutions, who are our partners in terms of, of, of strategic allies uh, amongst other communities. Where does that exist? Where are we all, in a certain sense, moving in the same direction, pulling, pulling everything in the same direction? And then you can identify very quickly if you are either for that, then I understand that you're about, in a certain sense, cultural democracy and plurality. And if you're not, then I understand that what you're about is is kind of neo-fascist colonialism. And now we know where we are. Right. You don't have to, I don't, you know, <laughs> and, and, and therefore we now can have a, a reasonable discussion about how we go forward. Yeah, because there's always that, I tell people all the time, there's always that, there's always that real moment that people kind of don't understand, like, I can, so, I, can, I can deal with the Klansmen better than I can deal with the fake ally. I know where he stands at. I know where mm -hmm. he's coming from. I know what I'm up against. It's hard to deal with someone who's pretending to be your friend, and but they're always going around your back. It's harder to deal with that person. I can deal with, I know where I'm coming from and what I have to face when that Absolutely. guy is showing me, he's showing me his, his hood. I know what the deal is. Exactly. And so speaking on that, like you said, with allies and how we've gotten to this far, this far, how do we, what, what do you have, or what, what is in your mind to address those who, even those who think they have been allies, mm -hmm. you know, well, think the they have been allies, but really don't know right. they've been working against the grain the whole time? Well, the first thing I start with is I don't want somebody to be for me what I haven't been for myself. That's the first thing. I'm not asking you to carry the weight. I had somebody from a, a predominantly white institution say, I want to carry that weight for you. I said, I don't need you to carry the weight. Right. You know, I'm, I'm James Brown. Open up the door. I'll get it myself. I don't, I don't need, I don't need, you know, I don't need nobody to give me nothing. I am fully incapable and endowed with the ability to, to, to move from point A to point A, to point B. So I think what it is is a sense of, of defining what, are, what is the agenda. I asked a young people, a, a, a group, I had a, a, a group of young artists and activists uh, a couple of weeks on the Zoom platform, and I asked them to dream. 
dream the world that you want to exist in as a black artist. And they couldn't do it. They didn't know what that was. They didn't know how to do it. So it began harder to say, how are you going to stand up in front of, you know, other communities that are saying, what do you want? And say, I'm listening to you and you not be able to articulate what your vision of the world is. That's the first responsibility you have to have. You know, I, you know, I kept asking, what's your cultural Wakanda? Minus, if there were no racism, if there were no colonialism, if there were no sexism, what would the world look like to you? And what, would, what world would you dream and create? And they couldn't do it. So I don't know then how you go forward to other people and ask them to be strategic allies if you don't know what you're asking for. Right. You know, I can immediately tell you what my cultural Wakanda is. I know what that looks like. You know, um, and I am constantly in the, in the process of defining and redefining it. So the first thing we're doing with our community of artists is pushing them to that sense. I want you to dream of a world. What does cultural literacy look like in the school? What does an ideal, what, what, what we're calling the 24, uh, the, uh, the 7, 24, 365 project is that every day that a black man, woman, and child wakes up, they should be able to go to a theater and see themselves. Every day. I don't care whether it's Easter. I don't care whether it's on Monday. I don't care whether it's, you know, it's Black History Month. I don't care. Whatever day you wake up, you should be able to go to some theater and see yourself. If that's not happening, then you have to make that happen. That becomes part of the insistence. That becomes part of the reallocation of funds. That becomes part of the looking at the, the larger agenda. What does cultural li literacy look like? Do we have one of those? No, we're in appendage in terms of performing arts programs and training where you are some unit down the road that, oh, you take black literature as opposed to being solidly in, in the middle of it. So I can't teach. You know, when I do, I don't teach Aristotle's poetics without putting Paul Carter Harrison next to him. It's impossible to do that, to talk about what does African drama look like in its institute. I, I can't teach Shakespeare without looking at, you know, uh, at, at Dulé culture in, in Africa in the 17th century. I can't do it because both of them existed at the same time. It's not an either or proposition. But if I don't create that literacy, if I don't create that agenda, if I, in concert with all of the folks who are about this, this work, create that paradigm, that worldview, what that looks like, how is it that then you can even strategically ally with anything when you don't know what you're asking for? So that's right. our job. It's inherently our job to define that. And then you can look in, in, at somebody else and say, either you support this or you don't. Because if it's only about you getting a job, which is what these young people, well, I just want them to do. You know, as one young man said, you know, I want to be able to do a, a role on stage that may not be traditionally, you know, uh, that was traditionally held by a white person, by a black person. And I said, I got that, but that's been done. Why are you asking for what's already been accomplished? But if you don't have a kind of historical perspective on what that is and dream a world that's beyond that, then that's what you're stuck with. And if you haven't been taught all of what your contribution is, you have no idea what to ask for. You're asking for stuff that's already been done. It's like you right. can't ask for what, what we did. You have to ask for more. So now our job and what we've taken on as our responsibility in this coalition is to say, dream a world. Let's create the landscape upon what does that look like? What does our cultural Wakanda look like? Right, right. Now we've defined that. Then you can go and say, now we want to have a discussion with our allies, with our partners, with those who are, and say strategically, this is what, where do you fall in the mix of this? I'm not asking whether or not you have to do it. I'm saying if you find it within your space and your mission to say, I want to support that, or I want to move forward, I want to be a part of that conversation, then we have something to talk about. And if you don't, you know, pieces, deuces, love you. And then we move on to the, to the next page. My day wakes up, as, as a buddy of mine said, being black is a 24 hour job and there ain't no lunch breaks. So right. I'm not looking for right. somebody to give me a vacation <laughs> on that. I will wake up tomorrow with the same mission going forward. I'm not reliant on somebody else to define for me what I should have defined for myself. Right, right. That's, and, and that's the view I have. Like I, like I said, I, I, I primarily worked in this, in this industry in the, the administrative side. I've worked in mm -hmm. the administrative side. And for me, it's always been everywhere I've went, you know, me and Freedom talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Me and uh, uh, Freedom Bradley Valentine from the Old Globe, we talked about this as far as being, you know, not just uh, Afro Americans in administration, but being African American men in in mm -hmm. administration that were unicorns. And ever since I've been in this, and ever since I've gone to all the conferences, my goal has always been, or my thought has always been, there needs to be more of us in this space. Like there needs mm -hmm. to be more of us in this space learning this skill set, learning these skill sets, 
broadening what we know we can do. My goal has always been, and I carry that responsibility with me is to, you know, as I learn every new position, I need, I need my son and my daughters to realize, oh, this, this, this is another lane I can go. I don't have to be on stage. I can be on the tech side. I can be on the administrative side. And then I can take those skills to any other facet of society and go wherever they have to go. It's like you said, what, what is your future? What is your Wakanda look like? So when people come ask me what I'm looking for, I'm always like, oh, I want the doors open. I want, I, 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 I want to, I understand there's internships, but you know what? There's a lot of people that can't afford to do internships. There's a lot of people who are capable of doing things, but they can't afford to come do it for free. So I want to find a way to open the doors for them to come in and learn this to get paid and get the passion behind them so that that's not a door close to them. So it's exactly what you're saying. What what do we see? And like you Absolutely. said, I don't want any I don't want anyone to give me anything. I want to work for it. I want to work for it. I want to innovate and I want to open the door for somebody else. Right. And and no and there's no one path to go from point A to point B. You know, it's it's not an either or proposition. It's not, you know, it's like I was talking to a, a, a theater that I worked here in Atlanta. She said, well, what are you talking about? You know, separate but equal. I said, no, it's not a book of the Washington proposition. It's saying that there is a work, that there, it is impossible for me to ask you to task you with the responsibility of, 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 of all the aspects of my culture. You, it's not your responsibility to do that. What may be your responsibility if you find an interest in saying, you know what, I want to have a conversation with artists that look like me and don't look like me about creating a, 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 you know, a, a kind of conversation and a language about what this country looks like. Yeah, and you have some. Bring yourself to bring your most extreme living room self to the party. And at that point, we have a conversation we both can stand on. We, we, we have work that we can both do, both within your institution and outside of your institution. Because I may only be in your institution for four to five weeks to do one particular thing. I'm not leaving there expecting you to do that work for, for 365, unless that's your mission. It happens to be my mission. And so I carry that with me outside of that. And where you can strategically be aligned with that, then there's, and it's always going to be around the work and programming, then we can find some, you know, some, some, some common ground. Where it's not, that's fine. Go do you. And you need to do you. Part of what I, you know, I, I, I grew up with uh, Russell Simmons. We all we all played basketball mm. together. And part of what he what he what I remember years back him saying, uh, he used to throw these. I'm from Hollis, Queens. He used to throw these parties, right? And we all and that's where his, his thing started. And then he took the right. parties from there and he went to NYU and you know, and then it kind of blossomed. But I remember having a conversation with him and he said, you know what? At some point in time, I wanted to deal with the globalization of hip hop because that's my passion. And I'm not asking somebody else. What I want to do is avoid the tricks of the past where we don't own the means of what that music is. We should own and be the beneficiaries of the music that we created. So my job is to build institutions where that happens, to create strategic, strategic alliances with record companies so that we, in fact, are uh, at the table talking about how this music goes forward. And that conversation then goes to Jay-Z. And that conversation then goes to Diddy. And that conversation goes to Rakim. And that conversation goes forward as you begin to look at, you know, uh, to Beyonce. As you look at artists as entrepreneurs that are saying, I am organizing the world around my passion and where there are alliances, I do it. And where I need to do it myself, I do. That is their cultural Wakanda. That's the argument that we haven't had in theater. Tyler Perry did it. He has a five acre campus that's 10 minutes from my house that I pass every day. And I'm like, go ahead, do you, Tyler? Where he right. says, nobody else is going to define for me how it is the work that I do, how I'm going to do it, and how it is that I employ it. So he comes and he rewrites a relationship, a business model, and, and a relationship of contracting with the unions based on his needs, his agenda. Doesn't mean that he's excluded. It doesn't mean that he's, he's separate but equal. It means I am organizing the world around my passion. And as I organize it around that passion, I am then going to work in, you know, in concert with other people who are doing the same thing. So there's a relationship between Jay-Z and Tyler and Oprah as they begin to exercise. It doesn't mean that they're not working in concert with strategic partners from other communities. It simply says they put themselves first, that they are the center of the universe and our culture is the center of the universe. And from that, those who want to part participate and be beneficiaries of, they join. Those who don't, no problem. I'm still going to wake up and listen to Rakim. It Rakim. don't matter. <laughs> it don't matter whether you have him in your box or not. I don't care. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's kind of like it's kind of like I say. Uh, we need. We kind of need a lot more Clarence Avant. 
We need a lot yes. more like black Absolutely. godfathers Absolutely. in the world that are that are connecting, that are that are connecting the circle. And, and it's our responsibility to bring them. We're trying to create roundtables in Atlanta where we bring legends and, and 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 young people together, where we begin in each one of the industry. Because part of what we haven't done very successfully is, is is like you're doing in this forum to create avenues of conversation by which. Younger folks, if they don't know that that you know what the significance of Charlie Parker is, and we can't get Charlie, somebody needs to know, and somebody needs to have that conversation so that they're not operating within a vacuum. And so our job, I think, as as artists, is again to continue creating the means by which those conversations can happen. Sometimes it's in a play, sometimes it's in a roundtable, sometimes it's in other means by which we create. Theater is two people in a blanket. That's all it is. <laughs> all the other stuff is just superfluous. You know, it's two people in a blanket and somebody who comes along and may stop and look at it. <laughs> and that's <laughs> all it is. And if we, we can deconstruct back to that, then we realize theater is everywhere. It's at the center of our culture. And how do we use that in service to what are the needs in that community? We are in service to that. The Black Arts Movement was in service to a political social strategy that was called nationalism, that was called civil rights, that was, you know, they were in service to raise consciousness, to continue with voter registration, to create a climate where those ideas had receptivity in the community. They didn't view themselves as them for their own sake. They viewed themselves in service of a greater cause and a greater ideal. That's what we have to continue to return to. We have to exercise that muscle because we've been out of the gym. We haven't been doing those reps. Time to get back. You know, we just got to, as Charlie Parker said, you got to go back to the woodshed. You know, we got to practice. That's right. We got to do that. Ralph Ellison said years ago, hibernation is a covert preparation for a more overt act. We're in hibernation right now. We are preparing for a more overt act. And that overt act, when we come out of this quote unquote Zoom world pandemic, is to say, We've had conversations, we've built institutions, we've built platforms, we've built models, we've built programming that addresses the larger racial pandemic, which is in fact, there is a viewpoint that white supremacy and all of its insidiousness has invested itself in institutions and, and people practice it consciously and unconsciously. So we have got to root that out. But first you have to identify it. What is it? What does it look like? It looks like redlining policies in banks. It looks like not access to healthcare in your own community. So you have to travel on a bus four counties over it in order if you want to see a specialist. It looks like um, you know uh, not having a, a certain kind of textbooks in schools. It looks like overcrowding in public. It looks like curriculum that is deficient. I mean, it 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 we see what it looks like. We see the symptoms of it. But well, we have to go out and say, no, this was part of a larger thinking that we have to root up. That's why it's called systemic, or what Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton said, institutional racism, that it begins to propagandize this notion that certain people should have an advantage and others should. Right. And it invests itself in policy, decision making, et cetera, hence why it is institutional. It doesn't mean there's a for whites only, for blacks, for colors only sign anymore. It means it's invested itself in policy and decision making. So it's, it's, it's the invisible, it's going on whether or not you see it or not. We have to identify that and say, this is where the inequity is. This is how we redefine. This is how we level the landscape. And artists have a role to play in that. And it's, it's, it's like you're saying that educational piece. It's almost like everybody, everybody went to school and learned about the Renaissance. But nobody understood that it was called a renaissance for a reason, that it was a reaction yeah. to the Morris culture that was just before it. Like, people don't realize that. People don't understand how far this, like, I, I talk to people about Paul Robinson every day, and they go like, who? He did what? He was what? Right, exactly. Like, it's the, it, like you said, it's that institutional memory. It's that institutional education that doesn't allow people to see beyond what they've been taught. It doesn't allow them to see beyond the representation that's keeping, that allows them to lock themselves into a certain place. Absolutely. It's what Paulo, Paulo Freire calls the pedagogy of the oppressed. You know, the piggy bank mentality of education, which is all students are piggy banks and we put in, drop into them what we want them to know. As opposed to a teaching model that says, no, your learning and your self-actualization is about encountering all of the instincts and all of the references in your life and creating a model for yourself that, that begins to empower you to see the world through your own eyes. And so part of what the tug of war is to do that, that we're no longer treating our young men and women as piggy banks of which we're going to drop certain amounts of information. No, we're going to crack that model and begin to say, how do you engage in, again, 
this, this view of the world, these points of view of the world that is all inclusive. And to do that, it's much like what Nonino Jones is doing with the 1619 project. We're not saying, you know, to rewrite history. We're saying to tell the whole story, you know. And if you tell the whole story, then and all of us have to listen to it, then we can make some judgment and some cr critical assessment as to what works, what doesn't work, where the contradictions are, and how we write the contradictions. You know, if we're not doing that, then you're getting some information in some elite school that, that is called Harvard or Princeton or somewhere else. And I'm over here in, 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 in you know, Slippery Rock College or, you know, P. Diddy University, and I'm getting a different set of, set, you know, I'm getting a different set of information. Right. Hmm. You know, no, there should be a kind of unilateral information that we're all getting so that then when we sit down and have a conversation, we're having a conversation, all understanding, having a, a similar worldview. Right, right. I want to ask you real quick, how's your phone doing? Is that, so I don't know. I'm not looking at it. So okay, okay. <laughs> I don't know how many. Oh, no, I can look and see. Uh, I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure you got enough juice. To, to, yeah, I think to we can make out. it, man. <laughs> but I, if we can, I'm an old man, so it's just it's, it should replicate the rest of my life. Oh, look at that last hundred yards, y'all. Y'all go, on, children. Go. On. <laughs> I want to remind everybody. I want to remind everybody if you have questions. Uh, you know, we're going to be talking a few more minutes. I want you guys to go ahead. If you have questions, start putting them in the chat room, whether you're watching on Zoom, whether you're watching on Facebook, uh, you know, and I'll get to as many of them as, as I can. Um, so, Tom, as we, as we look towards moving forward, because this is where my mind is at, and everybody mm -hmm. hears me say it, and I say this in, in every aspect of everything, like, you know, like we kind of started the conversation. Statements have been made. <clears throat> The, 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 the statements have been made, the promises have been made, the, the, the things are being written. Here we are talking on this platform that wasn't happening before. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I guess the question is, is it the same? Where do, where do we go from here? Because like you said, we're at this moment. It's like you said, we're all in this kind of, we're all kind of this pandemic space. We're all in this Zoom space right now. And the thing is, what are we doing right now? Are we just waiting for this to end or are we building? Are we really working in this supposed downtime? And for the people now who have stepped up and said like, oh, we realize we've been slipping. Mm -hmm. We want to do this. We want to enter into that space. I guess it's a two-part question. Going from this point forward, knowing we have nowhere to go, we really have nowhere to go from up from here. Like mm -hmm. pandemic's over, whenever it's over, we get back to the theater. Things have to open up at some point. You know, people are getting innovative. Theaters are starting to innovate now. They're moving shows outside. Programming is going to have to go from digital. We're going to have to go back to doing what we do, live theater. Going forward now, what's the responsibility for us? The, whatever, whatever, we, whatever we're called today, BIPOC, people of color, African American, whatever, whatever the phrase is this, this decade, whatever it yeah, is. I think this, and I think there's something problematic with saying BIPOC, you know, I, which is... Yeah, and part know. of the pro problematic is not the, the notion of it, is to say indigenous people have to define for themselves what that looks like and then speak to it. And again, we have to be a partnership and support that. People of color, you know, it's too broad. You know, I can't take on people of color. I don't know what that is. I. I shouldn't be that person to do that. But I recognize the need to do that because if we're going to talk about cultural plur pl plurality, we all have to have that discussion amongst our communities. And then my job is what I'm asking everybody else is to listen. So right. that when somebody from from an, from an indigenous you know community says, this is the, this is what is important to me. My job is then to support that because right. I understand what it is. But I can't be a, I can't be a bipoc. I, I just can't be. I, you know, it ain't my know. term. <laughs> it ain't my. It ain't, just ain't my sauce. I'm sorry, I can't do it. I like to do it, can't do it. Want to do it, can't do it. Because it's <laughs> because it demeans and and it's always that tendency to want to throw everything into this gumbo concept and to have a one size fits all. The work is harder than that. Yeah. It's more nuanced than that. The experience of being indigenous in this country and having genocide heaped on you and put on reservations is not the experience of those who have been you know, taken from Africa and, and brought over here in a slave trade. Both horrific. Both come, stem from the same kind of ideal of Western expansionism and manifest destiny. But what is important to a native community, an indigenous community, as they define for themselves, this is what empowerment looks like. This is what the world means. My job is to support that, to encourage that, to be an ally in that. But I can't define it. So therefore, don't, don't, don't say we're BIPOC. 
Right. Because now what you want, it's a kind of reductionism that's unfair. I'm black. Someone else is, you know, is, is, is Native American or indigenous. Someone else is Asian. Someone else is Jewish. Someone else, and each community should have the right to self-determine for itself you know, what its agenda, what its goals, what its objective is. And then we can sit down at a table collectively and say, this is who we are. Let's look each other in the face and now say, how, how do we, again, as Martin King said, that we are inextricably bound, you know, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. We're inextricably bound in a garment of human destiny. And what uh, affects one inadvertently or unconsciously affects us all. That's what I understand. That's what revolution is about. That's what changing the world is about, acknowledging somebody else's humanity in its fullness, in its realness, and not trying to, to, to make it, you know, an acronym. Right, right. I don't want to be a part of an acronym. I'm part of a people. <laughs> people because, have a tradition. <laughs> because, because, that's, because that's been part of the problem, right? It's just always trying to squeeze down. It's just always... Right always trying to squeeze down your existence, always trying to squeeze down what you are. Right. And, and, sque and marginalize it in that sense. A one size fits all. That what in fact reparations looks like for native, uh, uh, for native indigenous populations or you know, uh, uh, those Asians that, were, that come from a tradition of coolie labor in terms of World War II, that what that looks like should be the same thing of what happens with, uh, no, it can't be. It's not a one size fits all. And so, as we begin to look at remedying the, you know, the sins of, you know, of, of, of being in American life, we all have to have that real hard conversation that's nuanced, that's difficult, of hearing things we don't often want to hear, you know, myself including. When I was sitting there and being accused of being chauvinistic and, and sexist, I thought, oh, me? In my own institution? How dare you? I'm a black man and I'm struggling against, and they were like, can it? You know, we have to have a conversation. You need to hear what's difficult for you and how you unconsciously exhibit, you know, a uh, behavior of sexism uh, and how you, it now is investing itself in the institution you're running. And you say, you're right. And I can't speak for women. Right. My job is to be an, uh, is to be an advocate and an alliance as they begin to define for themselves and specifically black women, women then in general, as they define for themselves, what the issue is, what it looks like, how it manifests itself, why it looks like this and how it's rooted itself in its institution. Got it. Which means I then have to check myself. You know, where am I xenophobic? Where am I, you know, sexist? Where am I? Where do I begin to practice some of those isms unconsciously because I am part of a of a culture that educates and socializes you that way? Right, right. I know I went on a tangent. You had no, a whole different no. question. <laughs> that's, no, that's what's up. That's 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 what we're looking for. And Charles, I see you have a question. Go ahead and type it out so I can ask. Uh, so I can ask Tom. Um, no, I Charles guess Reese, what's up? I, know yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess what I guess I guess my to, to sum it up is like so what is the um you know like you said this is you know as we're looking at the activism and we see it's the young people who are in the street we see it's the young people who are out there what 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 is the message towards those young people out there right now that are going to be the ones to push this that are going to be all, I think this coalition of young people and activists is like heartwarming you know, um, to, to, you know, there was nothing that did my heart. My heart was, was, was at peace. And I realized, okay, we're going to be all right. Uh, it's the last couple of months of watching white, young, white, black, Latino, Asian, uh, and then being led by, you know, by BLM out in the street saying, we're going to push for justice and we're going to reorganize this world around justice. That in and of itself is cataclysmic. That's the event. That's the seismic event that continues to happen. Your question, what do we do going forward? One, we have to listen. Two, we have to plan. That we have to have in a certain sense, when people say, what do you want? Being very clear, this is what we want. You know, I'm, it was, I, I'm reminded of the old uh, Black Panther Party and their 10 point program. You know, they said, what do you want? This is what we, this is what we believe <laughs> and this is what we want. And it was clear. You know, and so I think we have to identify again, what is our cultural Wakanda? What do we want? What is it, what is it that will level the playing field? What does that look like? It's not simply about one person getting a job or advancing, but that's in fact the reshaping and the transformative property of what America can look like. How do we want that to look and feel? And what is our place in that? What, if, what does that look like? And then in the architecture, how does that break down in terms of programmatically? What does that mean in terms of what's in your institutions and what's not and what needs to be built? And as we do that, 
It's that, that's the kind of science work, that's the kind of hard work, that's the kind of rolling up our sleeves and saying, in this time when we are talking to each other, what does the, what does the, what does the world of black arts look like that's, again, in service to a community? That translates into programming, that translates into a, a curriculum, that translates into you know, a look. It then has action items. It looks like something. And so, again, as I start talking to the folks in my community, I'm saying, tell me what that looks like. So there's a group of folks that are putting together what they call a Legends Roundtable, where they want to, again, every month, begin to have uh, roundtables that engage younger artists and older artists in each discipline so that they can have a conversation and record that so that there's an archival sense of what, the, what in our oral tradition, the history of, 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 of those disciplines, of folks who have been working throughout the, the 21st, 20th and 21st century. We have a, a group of, of, of teachers and educators and artists that are saying, we're going to now put together something called a cultural, a, a cultural literacy curriculum. What that looks like from preschool all the way to the university system. And it's going to be detailed in terms of not only just the arts, but then it has to look like something. These are what the classes are. This is what the syllabus is. This, so they're working on that as an idea. We have another people working on the, what I said, you know, the uh, 24-7, 365 project, which is how is it that we begin to have a fun development for African-American theater and performance 24-7 that you can see it any day? What is that going to take? And then putting meat on the bones. What do all of it, we have something called, you know, the arts, you know, fiscal literacy. How do we create program for artists in terms of just being fiscally literate? You know, how do you have a 401k? Are you, do, how do you do taxes if you're a 1099 person? You know, I mean, how do you not get in trouble with the IRS because you, in fact, you're not, how do you begin to plan for when you're not working? And, you know, how is it that you, so we're pull, pulling together strategic uh, fiscal folks. Uh, from all different acts to sit down and have roundtables with artists telling them how they can deal with their own fiscal stability and their fiscal health over the course of the next year. In addition to then pulling together a roundtable people to say, how is it that we begin to address larger, you know, reallotment of funding towards all of these other kind of ends? So we have to dream and we have to dream big and then we have to put some flesh and some meat on the bones of what that looks like. That's what this preparation is. That is Ellison's charge of, you know, covert preparation for a more overt act. So that then when we step out, we can look and say, these are the myriad of things, the 150 things, the 10 things that looks like in terms of what our cultural conda is. Where are you in this mix? Do you want to participate? How is it that institutions, individual artists, PWIs, folks working in, in various mediums say, you know what, I like number five. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me partner with you on that. How does somebody in an institution say, you know what, this deals with our arts and education program. We would like to be a part of the, you know, creating a uh, cultural plurality within cultural literacy programs in school because we have an in-school program. Let's partner with that so that we're reflecting what that looks like. There are, but we have to make that plan. We have to create, and that's what at least in my community we're working on. Right. Let me get to a, a couple of questions. And from Charles Reese, he says, are we ready for a national black theater? We've been ready for a national black theater. That's been ready, that, right? That you know, yeah, and I think not just one. You know, um, when when you look at you know what is when we're starting looking at institutional models, when you look at Lincoln Center as a model, when you look at BAM as a model, when you look at the public as a model, you begin to see different you know different kinds of of organizations. When you look at at you know what's happening in each city and what it looks like, that should be replicated around the country. So it's not we're not tasking anyone to have it. You know, uh, in, in 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 any sense, just like the, having the, uh, uh, the 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 African American Museum of History and Culture in D.C. doesn't predicate that there isn't a civil rights museum in Atlanta and a civil rights museum in Mississippi and a civil rights museum in Birmingham. That each one of them have a role and a responsibility in terms of the larger of black life and, and recording and memorializing black life. You know, in this country, I think yes, we're ready for a national black theater as well as we're ready for consortiums and institutions all around. In Atlanta, we're working on 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 creating a cultural corridor where Tyler Perry exists at one side and we want to do a, a Lincoln Center kind of facility uh, on the other side, you know, two miles from each other within the cultural corridor called Atlanta and East Point. So that when you look and you see the part of the largest campus that's devoted to a performing arts complex, as well as one that's devoted to film and television. Right. If we can create that as a statement, then you're saying this is what a model for every city can look like. Right, right. Uh, Malvina, man, Malvina, this is my 
this would be a question might be for a whole another a whole another two hours to talk about. Malvina says <laughs> in, the 19, in the 1950s Brooklyn you were Jewish religion, Italian country of origin, or Negro race. I always wonder why we divided into these categories. Well, sometimes the categories are divided for us. Yeah. You know, we didn't call ourselves Negro. We called ourselves at some point Africans or, you know, or Jamaicans. We called our, you know, we were in part, part of the classification is one of two things. Either we'll empower you or it devalue you, you know? And right. so I think that's why, you know, the call for even like in the 1960s of saying we want to rename ourselves, I'm black and I'm proud was the sense of we need to take ownership and, and ownership of who we are and what we are and what we want to call ourselves and how we want to look like as every community must do not right. being called that by somebody else. Negro is a term we didn't create. We right. inherited it. It was imposed on us. Um, and so part of the rejection of that, being called colored or Alabama porch monkey or Negro or nigger or any one of a, a various sorts of, of, of part of the vocabulary was not, our, was not something we invented. And part of, again, empowerment said, let's reclaim the language. You know, let's reclaim the naming. You know, uh, and if we name it, it will have value. If we name it and we name it in our own image, then we are empowered to go forward. So I think the nomenclature of any community is responsible for that community to find for itself how it wants to be seen and heard and, and visited in the world. And yeah. if you, in fact, say, I don't want to be any of that, then I think that's as, that's as valuable as, 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 as being want to be called something particular. Right. What I'm not going to be called is BIPOC. That's what I know. <laughs> That's what I know today. Now that may change next week, but right now, this is what I know. I can only tell you what I know in the moment. So don't come at me with that, because I'm gonna look at you like you're short. <laughs> well, hey Tom, before we get ready to wrap it up, I, I know you've mentioned some things, but I want to give you time right now for people who are listening and you know, hopefully we'll be able to share links or tell people where to go to, you know, again, kind of give us a recap on some of the programs that you're working on right now. To, to advance these ideas? I think the major thing we're working on right now is, is something called uh, Black Arts Action uh, Coalition Plan 2021. And it's just a consortium of artists that we've gathered. And what it was, it, it, it sprung out of, again, the, 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 you know, the moment, the current political climate and the moment that we were in. And what we simply did was to make a charge to artists, a call to action. You know, we should do something in, our, in, in the interest of, of Black art in our community. So that's the major thing I'm working on. Everything else is tons of things. I just finished a musical on the life of C.T. Vivian, um, which luckily he got to see before he died. Hmm. And the big thing we've been working on it for two and a half years, uh, which is really to, to, to see the civil rights movement through the eyes of C.T., and the biggest thing that we did for at Emory University was we presented for him and the family in addition to other folks. And he stood up and said, please take this forward. So for us, the big charge was to get it because we knew he, you know, we had met with him a, a, a lot. And I knew that after his last stroke that he wouldn't be with us long. And our big charge over the last year was to make sure that he could see the project that, that we created uh, to memorialize his legacy and to get his okay on it. And it was in fact his last public appearance uh, and he stood up and actually, at the end of the piece, did a charge to young people in terms of tradition. And, and he looked and said, whatever you do, please don't let this particular play about, about not only my legacy, but those of others that we put in, John Lewis and, and all of those that were kind of architects of this point, please don't let that die. So that's working on parallel tracks. Um, the putting together of, uh, we were actually Broadway, we were, we were on this Broadway track until COVID hit. So we're going back to, you know, to seeing what that is. So it's the uh, CT Vivian musical um, uh, and uh, the, the Black Arts Action Coalition Plan are, are, are kind of things we're working on. All right, all right. Look, Tom, I, I know you've been on, I, I know you just like me, you've been on Zoom calls all day. <laughs> I, if you like me, your eyes are probably getting ready to go three different ways. Um, no, man, there, there are three. There are three of you right now, and and, and all three of you are good-looking brothers. I must say, all three, all three of you look great. <laughs> well, look, Tom. Look again, uh, on behalf of the rep and on behalf of our audience and behalf of myself, man. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, thank you, man. And, and I want to have you back sometime soon, man. I want. I want to have you back to talk to us man, again. Anytime, anyplace. Sam and Todd are two of my favorite human beings in the world. 
you know, um, they, they, they're, they're good folks who, who actually do good work. And, you know, when you start talking about allies and strategic partners, they're real partners. They're people who, who you know, they put their, their money where their mouth is and they're folks who I belong, aside from just enjoying working with them, I just respect them. And therefore, I know if you in the space, you know, you, my brother, I know you, you, you bringing it, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. I'm, I, and, I, I'm not, and I know you're keeping them honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, man. I'm like trying. A, I did 24 hour jobs, ain't no lunch break, my brother. I get it. <laughs> you ain't got time to eat a corn chip. I know nah, it's you. <laughs> not even a corn chip, man. <laughs> not even. A... <laughs> hey, Tom, again, thank you, everybody. Uh, I thank all of you for joining the call. Make sure you come back and join me in two weeks. I believe that is September 10th. I'll be talking with actor Minka Wilt. It'll be a great conversation. Make That's sure my girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's going to come coming yeah. in back to y'all, back to back. <laughs> Man, I, I, you better get a seatbelt. <laughs> Everybody. She's going to pin your ears back. She ain't playing. She got, that's okay. Yeah. That's, hey, that's what we're looking for. I, I can handle it. <laughs> I know you are. Everybody, you make, make sure you register at sdrep.org slash listening. Again, I will send you, a, I'll send all of you if you register. I'll send you an email next week and tell y'all what's coming on next. And uh, again, Tom, thank you very much. I appreciate it, man. I know it's late back there, oh, bro. Get pleasure. some rest. Get some rest. Get no, some I'm, on the, I'm, on your I'm on your time, brother. I'm, I'm in Vegas. So we're oh, okay, on the same okay, time. okay, 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 okay. Still get some rest. Like I said, these these, yeah, these yeah, phone calls got us got us yeah, going crazy, man. <laughs> hey, Tom, thank you very much. Have a good one, man. You too, sir. All right, and I'll talk to all y'all later. <laughs>